Hello and welcome to ITV News Meridian. Tonight's headlines in the southeast. On the up, the cost of living from the supermarket shop to heating the home and filling the car. The struggles that we're all facing right now. The cost of food has gone skyrocketing. Ukraine crisis, or global warming, you know, it's COVID situation, everything. Prices is so hard, you know, it's very hard. Easter travel disruption, three hour delays to cross the channel. Long queues and more than 100 flights cancelled at Gatwick. Airlines say COVID sickness is to blame. Also tonight, open to the public again. The Sussex home of Anne of Cleves, Henry VIII's lucky wife who kept her head and gained a mansion near the South Downs. And one minute spring weather, the next very cold, then grey and wet. What can we expect next, you think? Join me later for your full forecast. Good evening. The cost of living continues to soar and the biggest squeeze on living standards in generations, leaving people in the southeast feeling stretched. Energy costs are already up, an extra £700 a year on average per home. And council tax, national insurance, broadband and water bills are also rising this month. Inflation is at a 30-year high. In the 12 months of February, prices rose by 6.2% on average. Food, energy and fuel have surged and the Bank of England thinks inflation could hit double digits later this year. In the first of our special reports on the cost of living crisis, Derek Johnson reports on the impact of those rocketing prices. Darren Riley from Swanscombe's a veteran who spent six years in the army. He's suffering from a chronic heart problem, which means he can't work. We saw him in January when he was worried about mounting energy bills. Things are getting very desperate. I mean, my bills are mounting up, my he uh, heating, gas, electric are all mounting up. Three months on and Darren and his partner's energy company have told them to expect a significant hike. He'll look into whether they're eligible for a government rebate. Grateful for the help and the gesture, but if you're going to give people a rebate, you're, all you're doing, you're just moving the problem from today to a few months down the line, and that ain't going to solve any problems. Because as the months go by, the cost of living is still going to be increasing, and people will be struggling even further. Energy is one reason inflation's going up. It's also because of the rising cost of fuel and food. This food store is for householders doing their daily or weekly shop. It also delivers to restaurants that buy in bulk. Owner Musid Ahmed says he's worked hard to keep costs down over the years, especially for popular items. But it's getting harder, he says, with shoppers and stores feeling the pinch. People are worried um, because even we're talking to the public and the restaurant people say, how are we going to run the business? Chicken price is jumped within one week, it's been doubled. Oil price has been doubled. Yes, so I'm very worried. Well, some of the stuff's even not available. It's getting hard to get the supply. This is the main, main issue. A supermarket sweep is definitely getting more and more expensive. It's a matter of going around, shopping around, see where you can get your bargain from. But I would say things have gone up, really, the cost of food has gone skyrocketing. It's really terrible, you know, because it's very high, you know, because it's normally, it's, I don't know, for, you know, the Ukraine crisis or global warming, you know, it's COVID situation, everything, I think its prices is, is so high, you know, it's very hard. According to the Office for National Statistics, the average basket of groceries rose 4.2% in 2021. An average 800 gram loaf of white sliced bread is 4p more expensive than a year ago. It's now £1.9. Another staple milk is up 3p to an average of 46p a pint. Fruit and vegetables have also gone up. A one kilo bag of apples, 47p more on average, now £2.36, a 25% increase. Buying one cauliflower will cost 15p more. Some of the biggest increases have been seen in the cost of fresh meat. A kilo of chicken is £2.78, that's a 10% jump. 
and a joint of beef is £11.33. That's a 29% increase. But the largest rise is for margarine, an average tub, shooting up in price from £1.35 to £1.77. That's up by a massive 31%. Food is one reason inflation's going up. It's also because of the rising cost of energy and fuel. This is Keith Gambles supervising a driving lesson. He's been a driving instructor for 22 years, but now finds steering the business to be more difficult. He fills the car with petrol three times a week and puts aside £150 a week to do that. It's no longer enough due to rocketing fuel costs. This squeeze margin at the end of the day, I put my prices up at the beginning of the year and I don't really feel I can afford to do that again. It's unfair on my customers and at some point they can't afford me. So it's just taking a bit of a hit like everybody else on my income. It's, it's going to affect what I can do outside of my business. So it hits the bottom line at the end of the day. There are those in genuine fear of losing their livelihoods. This fish and chip restaurant on Brighton Beach worried about the shortage of vegetable oil. It's, it's going around everywhere. That if you can't get oil, you'll have to close. And if you have to close at this time of year, in the summer, down here, you've had it. You know, you're wasting your time. You might as well not bother reopening. The economy is facing a battering. It's more important than ever to make a little go a long way. Well, Derek is at a charity which helps people with food and other essentials if they are struggling. Derek, has the Basics Bank seen more people calling on them? Yes, Andrew, it has many more and it's a food bank that stocks the kind of items you'd expect. Tin food here. There's actually a whole vegan section and then just here to my left, a whole range of vegetables and fruits that come via fair share. We're going to speak to Oliver, who runs this particular food bank. So how many more people would you say you've, you've seen come recently, maybe this year? Yeah, it, an increase probably this year of about 10%. We obviously saw an enormous increase at the, uh, at the height of the pandemic, which was about 400%. But within the last two or three months, it's been about 10% up. I think a lot of us may perhaps assume that it's only people between jobs or who are unemployed that come to a food bank. But is that actually true? We have some fairly regular permanent, well, sort of clients who've been here for more than 45 weeks, but we're now finding that a lot of our clients are, the finances are very finely balanced. And if they're on universal credit, which many of our clients are, then if they suddenly get an MOT bill or a, a car servicing bill, that can push them into our arms. And you are yeah. expecting to see more people, yeah. it's true we to are. say. Yeah, um, absolutely, we are. We so are. we've got, um, what, I think we've got four, four baskets here. What do does this represent? So this represents um, the food that we would provide, which we physically deliver to, a, this is for a couple actually, husband and wife. Uh, and so we're trying to provide them with enough food for seven days, three meals a week, three meals a day. And we're trying to make it obviously including all the sort of basic sort of cleaning products and toilet rolls and things like that. Um, but also the standard tins, but also some sort of treats and luxuries, some banana cake. Yeah, stuff that, that they wouldn't be able to afford. But, I mean, what would this come to if you went to a supermarket and bought it? Somewhere between sort of 65 and £72. Pounds. So well, it's a lot of money. Well, thank you very much. And, yes, uh, this food bank, as many others uh, around our region, is going to see more and more people coming asking for help. Derek Johnson, thank you very much. And our Cost of Living series continues tomorrow. And on tomorrow's programme, we'll hear how families from across the South East are struggling to balance the books. We'll meet a single mum from Tenterden who relies on a food bank to feed her children. Craig from Whitstable who needs to charge his equipment to remain independent. And trainee paramedic Nicole from Swanscombe who says spiralling costs are affecting her mental health. We'll hear how record price rises are affecting all of their lives. In other news, fire crews have been tackling a blaze in North Kent. It broke out on an industrial estate in Strood near the River Medway. No one was injured, but firefighters asked locals to keep windows closed. Locals from as far away as Higham reported hearing loud explosions and the plume of smoke could be seen from Snodland several miles away. It's now under control. 
The Sir David Amos murder trial has been postponed again after the judge tested positive for COVID. Ali Harbi Ali is accused of killing the MP for South End West during a constituency surgery in October. His defence was due to start last Monday at the Old Bailey, but the case was adjourned when three jurors tested positive. It's now delayed again until at least Thursday. He denies murder and preparing acts of terrorism. A prolific burglar from Brighton who was arrested in a flat full of stolen goods has been jailed for almost six years. Police caught 46-year-old Terry Hughes after he was filmed by a passerby leaving the scene of a burglary last October. Officers found items linked to four other burglaries in his flat. Seven Oaks is getting ready to welcome a new influx of day trippers and tourists. It's been promoting the town's charms on the London Underground with the slogan only 35 minutes from London. The town's tourism department is hoping proximity to the capital and the number of independent retailers will help footfall. Now, many families have been looking for a holiday getaway for more than two years. Given the cold, wet April we've been having, a sunny beach in southern Europe has been especially attractive. But they've not been looking for long queues at airports. And Covid sickness among staff has been causing frustration and delays. And at Dover, the continuing P&O crisis has been adding to travel misery. The gridlock in Dover from the weekend has gone, thankfully, but there are still delays on the M20. Let's start with the airports first. And Heather Edwards is at Gatwick this evening. Heather, how have things been there today? Well, thank you. So they have improved a little here today. You can probably see and maybe even hear the runway behind me. There have been plenty of planes arriving and taking off here today. As you mentioned, of course, this is the Easter holidays now. This is actually the first school holiday since the pandemic restrictions have been lifted. So plenty of families trying to take advantage of that and have a foreign holiday. Well, earlier today, I actually went into the terminal and although there were still queues and it was busy, the uh, check-in desks for EasyJet and British Airways were particularly quiet. I think I saw only a handful of people checking in. We know, of course, that EasyJet has cancelled more of its flights here today. Earlier, we spoke to one of their customers, a lady called Charlotte Nolan, who should have flown to Ibiza from Gatwick yesterday morning. But just as she was about to board the plane, she was told it had been cancelled. The flight was moved to Tuesday, but then it was cancelled a second time. Bearing in mind, we were literally meant to board the plane 15 minutes um, from that and then after we just got escorted um, didn't really know what was going on at all um, I think just everyone was in tears and yeah it was not a very nice experience especially being our first holiday abroad together uh, since after the pandemic so yeah that's kind of what happened really. But Heather it's not just the airports is it? No, that's right, St. Gita. Of course, crossing the channel by ferry or by Eurotunnel also proving very difficult. There are no P&O ferries, of course, at the moment. And we know that, um, that DFDS have taken up only a reduced percentage of the demand for sailings. So what we're seeing is huge congestion and huge queues on the M20 around Folkestone. Uh, we should have some footage now of this was the situation at lunchtime today. So hugely improved from the weekend, but still queues of around three hours. Well, earlier we spoke to the travel expert Simon Calder and he said that he believed that the government would be trying to deal with this situation as a matter of urgency. I imagine there are some really serious talks going on, I very much hope there are, between the Department for Transport and the ferry operators as well as Eurotunnel about how you can solve the problem of getting hundreds of thousands of Brits across the channel safely and back again of course over the Easter holidays um, instead of this disruption. My theory is that we will actually see P&O ferries sailing sooner rather than later. Simon Calder there giving his thoughts on the situation. Meanwhile, a final thought from me. Operation Brock on the M20 will continue with space for several thousand lorries to be parked if necessary. Heather, thank you. You are watching ITV News here in the South East. Thank you so much for watching us. Coming up, Knit One, Pearl One, why taking up the needle is good for you and good for charity too. And a short marriage, but a long life. 
why Anne of Cleves has a claim to be Henry's lucky wife as her house in Sussex opens once again. And remember, you can find more on today's top stories by going to our website. Just head to itv.com forward slash Meridian. You can call us. The number's on your screen. It's 0808 1010 095. And remember, you can follow us. That's on Facebook and on Twitter. Now, how's your knitting? Any good? Impressive. Well, yeah, hospital <laughs> needs you if you live in the Medway town. Yes, why don't you get your wool and needles out for an Easter charity campaign to raise money for Medway Maritime Hospital? We sent Tom Savides to a knitting group in Gillingham. So did he pick up a few tips? Well, let's find out. Why don't you put down your mobile phone and pick up a pair of knitting needles? you'll be amazed at what you can achieve. Not bad for a few hours' work. June Laming is 93 years old. She's been knitting since she was a girl. Her technique has changed since then. When I was young at junior school in the country, as it was then, we used to go and collect sheep's wool from the hedges, spin it and dye it. And the boys would knit with it. They learned to knit. And you haven't looked back since? No. <laughs> Do you still go and collect from the hedges? No, <laughs> not now. Once a week, these ladies get out their knitting needles at St Matthew's Church in Wigmore near Gillingham. There's a real satisfaction when you've made something, however small. Um, it's something that I was taught at school when I was seven, and I've enjoyed it ever since. This group is taking part in an Easter charity campaign to raise money for Medway Maritime Hospital. Their chicks, bunnies and other woolly items are sold and the proceeds go towards equipment not directly paid for by the NHS. In the past, charity appeals have partly funded projects like a gym and a dementia therapy garden. Some of our fundraising events per year um, reach over £10,000. Um, our knitting appeal, you know, previously has raised a good 2000 These sessions were set up by the Mayor of Medway, and they're not just about knitting. Social isolation is one of the things, because sometimes um, people can go for weeks without seeing anybody, but if they can come to a group like this, they make friends. So, Audrey, what exactly do I have to do to become a star knitter? Well, there's the needles, there's the wool. Get on. All right, OK, let's have a look. Um, I'll tell you what, here's something I made a little earlier. Now, her marriage to Henry VIII was the shortest of any of his six wives. But Anne of Cleves did rather better than some of them. She did indeed. She was given a generous allowance and a string of impressive properties, including one at Lewis in Sussex. And Anne of Cleves' house has just reopened to the public following the pandemic. Here's Malcolm Shaw. <laughs> It's an outstanding example of a late medieval building, more than 500 years old. Anne of Cleves' house in Lewis was given to her when her brief marriage to Henry VIII was annulled. Anne was 24 years old and from Germany, half the age of her husband, who was growing stout and bad-tempered. But it was Henry who claimed to be disappointed she wasn't better looking. Divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. The rhyme that's helped generations of schoolchildren remember what happened to Henry's six wives. Anne of Cleves' marriage was the shortest, but at least she kept her head. And not only that, her settlement included Hever Castle and Richmond Palace, as well as this much more modest property. The marriage had always been more about politics than passion. His reputation probably preceded him, and it was probably, undoubtedly, any sensible person would say as a sort of prenuptial arrangement, I'm going to keep my head, thank you, and uh, this is what we would be looking at if things don't work out. So I think it was undoubtedly a very good bit of um, international negotiation and uh, being quite thorough in the background. The house remained closed to the public throughout the pandemic, 
and has only just reopened. But a historic building like this requires constant attention. It needs people inside it, basically. So there were lots of maintenance routines to keep up with. Um, sometimes it was just me, other colleagues, and then over the last few months we've been working on rehanging the exhibitions, cleaning the place, brightening it up, making it look as good as it could be. The interiors have been furnished to reflect how they would have looked during Anne's ownership, the first visitors back enjoying the authenticity. Knowing Anne Cleves uh, used to own a house, uh, we just like to see the actual house and the history of it and the tapestry. I think it's absolutely beautiful. It, it smells beautiful. It looks beautiful. Um, I'd love to have lived in this period of time. Anne of Cleves never lived in the house herself, renting it out instead. Despite their divorce, she remained friends with Henry and outlived all the king's other wives. Malcolm Shaw, ITV News, Lewis. Great to see it open and something to do in the Easter holidays, Very isn't nice. it? Very nice. Holly's with us now. Holly, it has been so cold mm. this weekend. Yeah, really chilly. In fact, Saturday night in particular was better. I mean, many mm. places had their coldest April night in quite some time. Uh, we can take a look at some of the figures from Saturday night uh, now. This is a lovely little uh, wren actually sitting there in the frost. Uh, but these are the numbers. So East Morling there, minus 3.5. Uh, Gowdhurst, minus 4.4. Most notably, Wisley, minus 4.9. That was their coldest April night on record so it just gives you a flavour of just how cold it's been in complete contrast to March don't know how well you remember March very, very well. mild wasn't yeah it? it was lovely mm. lovely blue sky yeah. exactly like this. it was yeah very very different so um, milder than average 1.1 degrees above average drier 80 percent of the average rainfall sunnier 130 uh, percent of the average sunshine and across the UK as a whole those are just statistics for us in the south but across the UK as a whole it was the sunniest March since 1929 uh, which was amazing the second sunniest March on record of course it feels quite a long time ago now doesn't it it does presumably then it's going to warm up again is Ooh, it you would love to think so I wouldn't said you would. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sadly, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow warms up, tomorrow is mild, there'll be some sunshine, a bit breezy, a bit blustery, especially into the coast, but sort of some places maybe getting up to 16 or 17. And then by Thursday, we're talking plummeting temperatures, the risk of something wintry, potentially return to some frost later in the week as well. So I'm afraid it's almost like winter isn't quite done with us just yet. Yeah. Wintry, that's always worrying the use of the word wintry. Yeah, yeah, couldn't rule out a bit of the white stuff, but we'll, we'll keep a close eye on it. Lots of uncertainty. OK, thank you, Holly. Let's get a few more details then with Holly Green. Feels like home, whatever the weather. Valent Boilers and Heat Pumps, sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. After our cold weekend, it was much milder uh, this morning, but it was wet for many of us to begin the day and windy, especially in parts of the coast. Now, as we head through tomorrow, I do think it'll feel very mild, really. I think we could see temperatures up to 16 or 17 degrees locally, uh, feeling very much like spring, but sadly it doesn't last. I think a lot of this week actually is often unsettled and we will see things turning that bit colder as well. So the bigger picture shows that, yes, we've got mild air in place at the moment, but weather fronts are approaching. Wednesday, we see outbreaks of rain and showers. And you can see that colder air tucking in for Thursday. So for Thursday, the chance of wintry showers. And as we push into Thursday night and Friday, possibly some sleet or snow. But there is a lot of uncertainty about the detail. So we will, of course, keep you updated on all the latest. Bit of patchy rain in places at the moment. Otherwise, just quite a lot of cloud through the night tonight. A few clear spells, I think, here and there. Still quite a breeze, especially into the coast, quite brisk winds around and temperature shouldn't fall away far. So values remaining in double figures, which is obviously very different to some of the recent nights that we've had. Into tomorrow, I think a cloudy start, a damp start in places perhaps too. But I am hopeful that skies will brighten. So hopefully some reasonable spells of sunshine coming through. Yes, still quite a breezy wind, less so than today. But I think into the coast, we're still looking at gusts up to around, say, 25 miles an hour or so. But 16, maybe locally 17 degrees. Our high tide times, we've got Margate at 3.13 and again at 3.33 into the afternoon. So I do think we'll see some showers and outbreaks of rain on Wednesday. You'll notice our dropping temperatures as well, bringing this risk of some wintry conditions and frost by night.
Valent. Sponsors ITV Meridian Weather. Staying cold. I'll be back with your late news in just a moment, though. The ITV Eve News continues with Mary Nightingale. For now, though, from all the team here at ITV Meridian, thank you so much for watching. See you later. Bye bye. Bye bye.